Good morning, everyone. Is it on? Good morning. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Thank you. Today it's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Eric Vance. He has received his training at University of Virginia and Dartmouth Medical Center in child and adolescent psychiatry. He's been with the Carillion family since 2012, and in addition to his clinical duties here and at Intercept, he serves as the clerkship director of psychiatry for the VTC SOM students and course director of multiple modules of the Child and Adolescent Fellowship Training Program, including a focus on trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy and forensic child psychiatry. He's an active participant in multiple educational goals here and at VTC SOM and was awarded the Teacher of the Year in 2018 by the Department of Psychiatry. He has multiple scholastic activities to his name, including book chapters, publications, journals, presentations at the national and state level, and at one point owned the copyright of two um, resili resiliency checklists. It's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Eric Vance. Thank you for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? I hope I'm wired correctly. Um, that introduction um, is a little bit inflated as, as I've learned to do with my academic CV uh, as far as book chapters, research, national presentations, all that. I probably have one of each, so <laughs> working on expanding that a little bit. Thank you. I guess uh, the first thing I have to do is um, probably read this word for word to avoid getting taken away in handcuffs. I have no relationships, affiliations relevant to any entity producing, marketing, reselling, or distributing healthcare goods or services consumed by or used on patients relevant to the topic on which I'm speaking, unless I can get RVUs for this. <laughs> and Janie already told me she's not giving me a speaker's fee. And finally, um, I am writing a book, but I've been doing that for 20 years, and my wife thinks I'm never going to finish. Um, so. That's all in the future, and uh, we'll see if I can profit on this someday somehow. I hope my patients are profiting on it, though, in truth and all seriousness. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk about today is really how I've come to use a framework of looking at risk and resilience in, in the work that I do with kids uh, in mental health. And um, it's, it's relevant, obviously, for pediatricians, my colleagues uh, in the medical profession, um, because mental health is so integrally related to the medical problems that we see in our clinics and our emergency rooms and so forth. But also, um, in, in the fairly recent past, um, there was a transition of knowledge um, about risk factors that we used to kind of own in psychiatry, psychology, and sociology. We used to talk about psychosocial risk factors um, that w were in our society and in families that could lead to mental illness and substance abuse and all the bad sort of psychosocial outcomes. Um, and, and, and it's pretty consistent in, in the sense of how risk factors work. And, and when, when the, the researchers on risk factors have looked at how they work, there's sort of this fairly consistent finding across a, a number of studies and, and fields that uh, is almost a remarkable kind of uh, uh, universal uh, phenomenon whereby it seems that when people grow up with one, two, or three, four risk factors in their lives, there's sort of this um, tolerance of, of those risk factors up to a certain point, and then there's an exponential um, increase in the odds of what's called poor outcome, what we'll just call poor outcome for now. And the poor outcomes really are um, pretty variable. Um, and what happened a few years ago is that um, some internal medicine guys in a um, big health insurance company in California called Kaiser, um, looked at, started thinking and seeing that a lot of their medically ill patients had a history of childhood adversity. Who's heard of ACEs? 
Raise your hand. That's good. Um, I hope by the end of this, everybody will have heard of ACEs and kind of put it into your brain and, and into your practice. Um, and they chose um, 10 big and common um, adverse childhood events, which is what ACEs stands for, adverse childhood events. And, and really what that is is simply a subset of, of some uh, an ex fairly extensive list of risk factors that I'm going to quickly go over um, because I don't want to dwell on risk so much as talk about resilience and, and protective factors, which are sort of the counterpart to risk. But here are some of the, these are the 10 um, big ACE factors that were looked at in this study of 17,000 Kaiser privately insured California residents. So this wasn't necessarily a Medicaid population like we're used to seeing in a lot of our clinics where you have a bunch of impoverished people. These are fairly much like the people in this room. And what they discovered on that list of 10 ACEs is that two-thirds of this 17,000 had at least one ACE. Um, and one, one out of five had three or more. And not only did it predict the usual things that we'd been knowing for a long time, that mental illness and um, depression, suicide, drug and alcohol use, but here comes liver disease, smoking, COPD, heart disease, stroke, all the major big public health problems across the board were predicted by um, having a high ACE score. This was really eye-opening to the medical community, though from the number of hands that went up, maybe not eye-opening enough yet. <laughs> you know, because th these findings are about probably by now 15 or 20 years old um, from the original ACEs studies. Um, but it was the first time when they started to show the dramatic impact of adverse childhood events on long-term grown-up health problems. And, of course, we know, and everyone in this room and in this audience knows that those uh, adult uh, illnesses start in childhood. Now, the, the, one of the myths that I want to dispel um, today is that ACEs is really all that you need to know about in terms of risk factors. Um, ACEs was 10 of the, of the known risk factors that, that uh, have been well studied for years in, uh, in, in the literature um, that also include all these. A big one is right up here, family poverty. And if you think about family poverty, things like frequent moves, poor attachment to a, a, a caregiver, other traumas, all the various traumas that we see in, in the kids that we work with, um, stress in utero, complications of pregnancy, having a risk temperament, struggling with a childhood chronic medical illness or a early behavioral disorder or developmental delays, any of those other risk factors simply compound and add to whatever your ACEs are. So, so it's really important to be aware of all of these things. And if you start looking at um, the kids and families that come to, a, say, our clinics who are, are Medicaid folks, automatically they have poverty, right, <laughs> or a chronic illness, um, because th that's what qualifies you for, for Medicaid. And you start digging deeper, and pretty soon you have two or three and four five risk factors, and up you go to the bad outcomes, and that might be why they're in our, in our clinic. So the bad outcomes are really, at this point, we've expanded from developing some sort of mental or behavioral disorder, substance abuse, ending up maybe in educational special ed services, possibly in the juvenile justice system, and later on, eventually in adulthood, developing some of the serious medical illnesses. So ACEs, early childhood events, adversities, and risk factors are predictive of all of those bad outcomes. And the somewhat tricky but, um, I guess, intellectually satisfying thing is it doesn't so much matter which risk factor. 
It matters how many. So people who embrace and want to do research on one particular risk factor, um, good, I'm glad, but people want to simplify things sometimes saying, but if we just fix this risk factor, then everything will be better. But really, it's not which, it's how many. So that's the thing that escalates your bad outcomes. But then the other sort of sober and curious thing is that more than half of us will endure at least a major trauma. And you saw literature where two-thirds of us, and I'd say us, I'm talking about everybody, um, has an ace or two. Because in, in general, um, we can endure an ace or two or three. Our bodies are resilient enough to endure those things. It's when you start piling risk factors on top of each other, that's when you get to the exponential thing. Now, trauma, which is one component of risk, and I'm going to make an argument a little bit that all risk factors are simply stresses or traumas neurobiologically, which I'll show you in a minute. But about one in three or four people who go through a major trauma will develop PTSD. One in three or four. That's about a fourth or a third. How many thought it was more? Really? Come on. Um, yes, but the, the, the little secret is that the people that don't necessarily develop PTSD per se by the book and the criteria often develop what, we, what I call trauma effects, which are, are drags and harms on health, mental health, and, and can tend to substance abuse disorder. So a lot of us have seen, for example, the, the kid or adult who went through some significant trauma and really it led to their drinking problem. And now they show up with a drinking problem. And really, if you get to the heart of what triggered and started their drinking problem, it started with self-medicating when they found out that drinking could make them, make them stop thinking about their trauma <coughs> briefly, and they develop alcoholism, liver disease, and so on and so forth. So they don't necessarily have PTSD per se, but they have alcoholism and all the sequelae from that. And that's how trauma works, because it's a lot more um, uh, diverse in its effects than just PTSD. So here's the, the stress response in the brain. This is the only thing that you're going to get tested on at the end of this uh, thing. So you memorize this slide if you can. And you, no, I'm just kidding. But the um, stress response is pretty standard across all of those um, risk factors, right? Because risk creates stress. And the way stress is processed in the brain is primarily initially through the thalamus, which is the waste station of all of our sensory input. And whenever we sense danger or uncertainty or, or uh, the potential for danger, it goes hot, uh, fast track to the amygdala, which is the sort of the emergency response center, which senses danger. Cross talks a little bit with the hippocampus, which encourages us to calm down if the context is safe after all. But if, if this is a go-ahead, then the amygdala calls on all the emergency response centers of the brain, which include everything from a defensive startle to the sympathetic nervous system activation with adrenaline and norepinephrine and all the, uh, the emergency uh, center releases of a cortisol releasing factor, which goes over here, releases cortisol, which can be toxic to the hippocampus and kill off uh, hippocampal cells and probably diminish the capacity of the hippocampus to accurately perceive context. So it can't shut down the amygdala as well as it used to before all of the chronic cortisol from chronic stress, which is somewhat different than acute stress. Um, but I don't have to explain the difference between chronic and acute, but in any case of emergency, norepinephrine gets released from certain parts of the brain, dopamine, which is responsible, we know, for fear, vigilance, and paranoia. If it gets too often elicited, can create this in a chronically stressed person. Facial fear um, expressions by activation of certain uh, um, involuntary uh, expressions of facial fear, uh, fright, 
fight, flight, or freeze um, types of uh, behaviors emit from a certain part of the brain. Nucleus accumbens, which is the reward center, um, which we are very familiar with nowadays in respect to substance abuse and the reward center. But what it can lead, chronic stress can lead to anhedonia, where you have less sense of reward, and so you self-medicate to try to jack up your nucleus accumbens release of dopamine and so forth. And, and there's some effects on the, the vagus nerve that can, that any emergency first responders will tell you they've seen in the scene of accidents and the startle response and, and so forth. So that's the stress, that's the stress response. And um, as a friend of mine uh, in psychiatry school used to say, so imagine that feeling that, uh, that you have when somebody jumps from behind the door and scares you, play, hey, you know, and he's like, <gasps> imagine feeling like that all the time. Right, that, and that, that's kind of what ends up happening. With all this, when that happens, you have this response, and people with chronic stress, um, for example, some of the risk factors that we've just listed, um, go through that in a chronic basis, and it really wears down the, the uh, nervous system and, and a lot of these systems that are designed to activate in the acute setting and then go away when things are safe again. So this is another little cutesy way of thinking about the different ways that trauma and stress impact on the, the brain and all the, on the aspects of behavior that, that we're concerned with in psychiatry, but in a broader sense in medicine, because down here in the ABCs, S is the somatic stress-related disorders and symptoms that we see in everything from childhood to the adult disorders, um, the same kinds of processes lead to all of these problems. And, you know, going down the list, you see all of these different kinds of problems that can arise from a history of trauma um, that may not be self-evident to a person just uh, that, for example, bullying behavior can emerge from a kid that's been traumatized, um, self-injury uh, and reactivity of their, of their uh, physical startle um, behaviors and so on and so forth, where um, we can confuse, for example, a bad kid with a traumatized kid and not understand that where those, those behaviors arise from. <coughs> now that you're adequately depressed about the, the uh, um, chronicity and difficulty of the stress problem, I'm going to get to the hopeful part of my lecture, which is, uh, and, and it's the thing that kind of keeps me um, from, I think, burning out um, in my job. Burnout's a big thing these days, and I've kind of wondered why, why don't I burn out? Um, but I, I kind of uh, think what happened to me over time is that uh, I've become more absorbed and interested in sources of resilience and how can you put those into the lives of kids and in their individual way as they come in and out of my office. And of course, you know, it, it's inevitable that you sort of begin to reflect on yourself and your own family and so forth, and, and it becomes uh, a little bit more uplifting. Um, but I started getting interested in this in a sort of a cynical way um, back in medical school when um, <laughs> We were hearing the, the lectures about risk factors for cardiac disease, for example. But then everybody's like, yeah, but what about my grandmother, the 90-year-old who sits on their back porch smoking cigarettes and eating bacon for breakfast, and she never had a heart attack? <laughs> that. She got all the risk factors, you know? And, and so you start wondering, like, what is this whole, the whole risk thing is, it's, of course, a, a real thing, but, what, you know, what's tempering the, the risk? Why, why is it that some people don't succumb? And, and so then I started seeing this literature on these longitudinal studies of children that grew up in all kinds of different terrible adversities, and, um, such as growing up in a family with a parent who's schizophrenic or growing up in inner-city Baltimore 
or growing up with the alcoholic or, or drug addicted mom. And they would follow these kids all the way from birth to um, adulthood, and they found that at one in three, first of all, this, actually this is, this is a community set. One in three of all children, if you go out into Roanoke, are high risk. By our definition of exponential, four, greater than four or five risk factors makes you automatically high risk. Then the only remaining question is, are you resilient or not? And about one in three of the high-risk kids seem to do okay without the bad outcomes that we're talking about. So that leaves about one in nine, one in ten, depending on your math, of, of kids that are resilient. And they usually grow into somewhat resilient, at least relatively resilient. Resilience is relative, right? It's not absolute. There's no silver bullet and there's no magic and even the most resilient person that you meet, lightning can strike. Um, but relative resilience, when you look at risk factors, and now we're gonna look at protective factors, is, is a thing. And the other cool thing about it is when you start looking at re these resilient kids, they all look the same. Cross-culturally, they've done studies of resilient people, they look this similar, they have similar aspects that seem to constitute resilience, much like risk. Risk is the same the world over. So what are they? Here's the duh moment, all right? These are the protective factors. The protective factors are kind of broken down into a few realms. And if, uh, if you aren't sick of mindfulness yet as a resilience factor, um, let me just tell you, it's not the only resilience factor. Not that it's bad. It's good. Mindfulness meditation is good. But it's not the only protective factor. And it's not the only source of resilience. And a lot of, you know, the, as much as we hear about mindfulness, it's great. And what it, what it is a, a component of is one portion of what can constitute resilience in a, in a person. And basically what mindfulness does is it, is it helps you with emotional control, dialing down some of that stress, um, cascade that I showed you earlier. It helps you dial that down, helps you with emotional control, um, helps with positivity and some things like that. If you do it in a group, it a, becomes a structured group activity. So yoga, for example, or going to a mindfulness group, you probably get your mindfulness with your emotional control and dialing down your, your, uh, your brain a little bit, and you also get the benefits of being in a group. But Going down sort of area by area, the, the sources of resilience for these kids that we've seen who survive adversity seems to be that possibly in any given one, they might have had a strong parental attachment where they might have had one risk attachment. They might or might not have had some extended family ties that helped them. They might or might not have had some peers or mentors that helped them even when they had terrible family support. So every resilient person is different, but every resilient person is the same in the sense that they seem to grow a pile of protective factors in one area or another that might offset an absence of protective factors in another area and uh, invariably a pile of risk factors that they're up against. Some things like in the home setting, such as predictability, routines, rituals, and structures that might get put into the place by a, a parent who sort of stands up against the poverty that they're embedded in or the other adversity that they're struggling with, that can be protective. Any given kid developing a skill or a competence and gaining the confidence that might come from that in a sport or a club or a musical instrument or dance or working on small engines in their backyard, any skill or competence can build confidence and, and, and serves as a protective factor. Involvement in any structured activity, whether it's a, an extracurricular at school or a church youth group or, or any kind of involvement in a structured a group activity is predictive of resilience. Some people are, have one-stop shopping to get their resilience at school because they're good students and they 
connect to their school and they might have a teacher there who's a mentor and they have a long-term plan to go to college and, and, and complete their um, and even some things with all due respect to science and math, reading is a protective factor um, where the others haven't been shown necessarily to be a protective factor. Not that there's anything wrong with it, because if you're in the science club, that's a structured group activity, right? <laughs> personality variables. Everybody has met the magical personality of the person with high EQ, emotional intelligence. They're empathic. They have a sense of humor. They're altruistic. They're positive. They have emotional control. They don't lose their temper quickly. And th these can be inborn characteristics of personality. And that, that's, a re by definition, a sort of a resilient personality. Not everybody has that. When they put electrodes on, on the frontal lobes of those people, they generally have higher activity on the left side than the right side. Don't ask me completely why. I have a few theories. But um, you can put anybody in this room on, on a uh, EEG just on your frontal lobes, and if you're biased to the left side activity, you're going to be more resilient to the people that are biased to the right side activity, um, who are more negative, more easily angered, less resilient than the people. And then notice that left side is like reading, language, talking about your problems, talking about, you know, telling the story talking about your trauma, writing stuff down, journaling. Notice how a lot of those things have been found to be therapeutic. They seem to build on the left language side of the brain. The right side is more social, emotional side of the brain, visual, spatial, a lot of artists over there. Um, but we know that artists sometimes can be a little bit, you know. <laughs> and so, and then finally, there's resilient outlooks that, that resilient people have been found to have. And this is sort of future-mindedness. They think about the future. They plan. They're optimistic that they can, do, they can take control of their own destiny. They often have faith that they use or prayer, inner faith. Um, and, and if you'll notice, some of the things that are predictive of um, outcomes in substance abuse or even in trauma, for example, one of the things we used to learn about PTSD victims is that they lost their future-mindedness. They can't think about the future. They, they can't think beyond today. Um, we we uh, have Dr. Bickle in uh, the uh, research center studying um, what's called delayed discounting and where you discount the future. You don't, you don't sort of care about the future. And people that are not future-minded, that's a bad outcome versus people who are resilient seem to plan for the future, think about the future. They're able to visualize that. And, and uh, you know, an old therapist trick is to get a person to talk about what do they want to do in the future. And as soon as the words are out of their mouth, which may have never escaped their lips before, it becomes a little more likely to happen until you get the words out of your mouth and you make a plan and you put it out there. It's not going to happen um, for some people. So those... That's sort of a rundown of the, of the protective factors. Again, it's like, duh, well, all this, you know, I mean, and part of the reason why it's a duh for a crowd like this is that there's a lot of resilient people sitting in here, and there's a lot of people with a lot of those protective factors. And if you think about growing up in healthy, whole, wholesome families, a lot of these things come naturally or instinctively in a healthy family. But we don't necessarily focus on them in a high-risk family that's lacking them, we don't necessarily know where to start. Where do we start? And pretty much you can start anywhere. Because the other comforting thing about the resiliency literature and, and, and beginning to work with and think about resilience is they've also found that there's a, a very similar sort of mathematical dynamic about protective factors, too. Doesn't necessarily matter which one you have matters what? How many, right? Just like risk. So then it becomes a, a fairly, this, this sort of balancing act. Now I'm going to tell you since you got to see the stress thing and maybe you've seen that, you know, if you're, if you're interested in looking at closer at the stress thing, Dennis Charney kind of dissected it and did that. I, I stole that from Dennis Charney. This I stole from Steve Porges, who is a guy who's 
brilliant guy in terms of knowing the comparative and evolutionary anatomy of the autonomic nervous system in humans. And when you understand the autonomic nervous system, we pay a lot of attention to fight and flight in the sympathetic nervous system, right? And we do that at our peril because that is ignoring a lot of what's going on in the parasympathetic side of the nervous system, right? Because the parasympathetic nervous system is the counterpoint to the sympathetic nervous system. They kind of balance each other, right? So sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, emergency response system, amygdala, danger, all that stuff, right? And then when your stress goes away, it's supposed to calm down. You know how it calms down? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic kicks in, helps you calm down. You know what you're accessing when you do mindfulness meditation? Parasympathetic, right? Parasympathetic is about rest, relaxation, restoration, reproduction, sexuality is all in the parasympathetic nervous system, feeling safe, loved, comforted in a safe environment, laying on your couch, chilling, watching TV, taking a nap. Guess what kind of breathing you're doing when you, when you fall asleep on your couch? Belly breathing, yoga breathing, deep, slow, relaxed. It's a, it's a sign to your brain that we're safe. And it's diametrically opposed to sympathetic arousal, right? So to the extent that we can elicit it voluntarily, we're imposing on the brain relaxation, restoration. We're getting our brain and body into a state of parasympathetic arousal, which is healthy and health-inducing. Your immune system goes, your, your immune uh, modulators go up and so on and so forth. So, so, there, so the counterpoint to danger signals from the environment is it's safety signals. You can't do all that stuff when there's danger or stress going on. That's why a lot of people say, I can't relax. I'm too stressed at work, I just can't relax. Well, the, the, the trick there is tricking yourself into thinking you're relaxed by doing tricks like slow yoga breathing your body thinks you're relaxed, even though in your brain you know that you still got that stress at work. You can do things that can make your brain feel from the bottom up or the top down. You can trick it into feeling you're safe. The way you trick it is that you use some of the same uh, parts of the brain that we use naturally. The fusiform gyrus sort of is, the, is that thing that looks at somebody's face and sees, is this a safe face, a happy face? Somebody that I feel comfortable around, or is this a, you know, am I meeting the eyes of a dangerous person here? And that all gets, gets sort of dissected through this part of the brain as a safety signal or a danger signal. And if it's safety, it inhibits the, the, the amygdala, okay? It tells the hippocampus that we're in a safe context. And then all of these things get in a chain reaction uh, you get hypothalamic reactivity to safety, where you, you suppress cortisol function and you actually increase oxytocin secretion, which is a little bit, you can think of oxytocin, we know it as sort of the love and relationship uh, hormone now. We used to, when I was in medical school, we only knew it as um, uterine contraction, so we'd give Pitocin for inducing labor. It causes uterine contraction, and, and uh, milk, ejection on nipple stimulation. Those were the two things we knew about oxytocin when I was in medical school. We know now that it's involved in trust building, um, developing relationships with people. It gets elicited in everything um, relationship oriented from a smile and a handshake between people to sexual orgasm and everything in between, including massage and any kind of proxy or signal of safety and social support elicits oxytocin, which then in turn activates this set of odd cranial nerves that we learn in medical school are associated with the parasympathetic nervous system. I don't, we didn't know why and what that meant, but we knew that three, five, seven, nine, and 11, right? Is that the, am I right on that? 
Seven, nine, eleven, ten. Ten. Don't forget Vegas. Vegas, particularly the ventral Vegas, because when you start reading Porges, which I hope you do, he's an interesting guy. He'll, he wrote a book called Polyvagal Theory. What humans have developed is two sides of the Vegas. One is the good old Vegas for digestion and, and heartbeat. The other is the ventral Vegas, which is a lot more nuanced and takes a lot of input from what are you reading in facial expressions and that guy's eyes and that person's face and their smiles and how do we interpret it and how do we respond with our social engagement system? What's safe? What's not? Humans are very complex. I don't, you know, if you don't know already in terms of their, their social engagement system. And here's all those, those uh, cranial nerves that have parasympathetic components. And you'll notice these are for some of the most intimate, interpersonal and social um, connectedness types of, of things that we do in life, from child care to being a baby to taking care of a baby to being in love and having social support. And all of that stuff um, applies a, a vagal break. It lowers heart rate and blood pressure. It leads to relaxation, perception of safety. It improves uh, immune functioning and serves as a protective uh, mechanism. So a lot of the protective factors are working through this. So, you know, I've kind of tip my hand a little bit, so loving supports, how does that work? You know, that was one of the things, like, all right, if, if all these risk factors cause all this stress and harm, and, and we know a lot now about the, the stress effects, we can, we can actually see stress effects in the brain, we can see them in the body, um, hardening of the arteries, we can see, um, we, we see inflammation now when we look closely at uh, the onset of major depression, we're getting into the the realm where we're starting to understand that some depression and mental health problems might be an inflammatory response due to immune dysregulation. Um, and, and, and so if, if that's happening on the stress side, there must be some pretty strong biological things happening on the protective side through the parasympathetic arousal system. Well, when you start looking at oxytocin, what it does is it decreases anxiety it actually enhances wound healing. If you look at um, um, some of the literature on um, wound healing, did you ever look that up? All right. My, I, I had a medical student recently who's going into plastic surgery, and I was talking to her about uh, um, how they've shown that oxytocin applied to, to wounds can enhance healing and, and speed healing. And we know a lot about how um, being in a close, personal, loving, supportive relationship can decrease your uh, time to recovery from um, heart surgery, decrease the days in ICU. I mean, a lot of different kind of medical findings with social support. And, and, and believe it or not, even things that are known protective factors like religion and faith um, involvement, uh, interfaith, going to church, church youth groups, uh, have been shown to be protective factors in some people who have them and participate in those. But also then when they look closely at, at that, what they've found is that, that actually the immune indicators and in some, some of the um, interleukins uh, uh, can be enhanced in those kind of situations. We don't necessarily know why. I, I have a lot of theories about why because I'm kind of obsessed with this, like how to, like, neurobiologically how do protective factors work because if we can figure out how to do fast track to those things we can really be cooking with gas in terms of building people's resilience but for example if the way I think about God if you, whether you believe or not but the people who believe in God seem to confer some protection um, it's the perception that there's something out there that loves you you know something up there out there wherever that loves you, you're feeling loved, your body's getting the, the same kind of feelings that you do in a loving relationship, you're feeling supported, you feel like you have a perception of control, which is a, actually a perception of control which goes to um, uh, having emotional control, 
having an internal locus of control, which is a protective factor, that's a big modulator of cortisol, drives down cortisol. So if you have the perception of control, whether you have actual control or not, you get, a, you get to modulate your cortisol by that. And that's why a lot of us have these really neurotic habits of that make us feel in control, even though it's kind of stupid, like just to spend all that time arranging your desk or picking weeds out of your garden, it gives you a sense of control and it brings your cortisol down. <laughs> and, and so it gives you a little bit of, it gives you a little bit of sympathy for the control freaks too. They're just trying to modulate their cortisol. <laughs> They're trying to get stress relief like everybody else, even though they're jerks. Okay, so, so that's part of the thing that can modulate. And, you know, testosterone has a bad name, but if you have competence, if you're good at something, if you feel you're good at something, you perceive that you're good at something, you get a social victory by actually maybe winning a contest, a tennis match, a chess game. You get a bump in testosterone which is good for men and women, by the way, um, and it, in spite of its bad name. It does cause some problems. Women have a generally lower level of it, but proportionally, if they get a bump, it helps them too. Antidepressant, you know, so, so there are, going down the list of the individual protective factors and the classes of protective factors, there's neurobiologic evidence from a variety of studies that kind of point to some mechanisms that begin to make sense if you tie it all together. That's why it's important to, to do it. So, so it is important to do mindfulness, right? Because you can probably plastically change your brain from right to left brain circuitry by doing regular mindfulness meditation, it gives you emotional control. By, by actually reading, writing, journaling, we know that that probably builds up the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the left side. Um, faith and future-mindedness seem to modulate immune support and, and, or immune uh, function. Um, school skills help with problem solving. Problem solving, if you think about, which is a, a, a good problem solving is a characteristic of resilient people. The better problem solver you can be, the more resilient you're gonna be. There's another duh moment, right? But if you think about problem solving, it's the ability to feel a perception of control come what may. I don't care what problems you have. I'm going to be able to solve this. I'm good at that. You have the perception that you're good at it. You actually get some skills at it. It really enables you to get, gain a perception of control over problems that can modulate your cortisol down. People that are cool-headed and kind of mechanistically attack a problem. So the more that you can teach a child, for example, problem solving, you're going to be helping them. I know that I'm out of time now, but just to show you kind of a summary of what we've covered, I, and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to leave some time for discussion and questions, but if you see here, safety versus danger signals going into the brain, either you're getting this stress side or you're getting the protective factor side. And if you think about some of the protective factors, we've talked about some of them are fairly cognitive, right? Left versus right brain, cognitive, so future planning, those things dwell on the, on the cortex of the brain. They're sort of, they're, they're sort of attitudes and thought processes that we, can, that we can work on maybe or might be blessed to have them somehow in our life. And they seem to confer their protection by being able to reach down into the lower trouble-making parts of the brain, the amygdala and the, and the emotional um, limbic system down there, and exert their, their control from top down. But there's also a bunch of protective factors that can be built simply by putting your body through things. And I call these sort of the bottom-up mechanisms to, towards protection. So you don't need to necessarily work on the, on the cortex. There, there's some other things that you can get people plugged into and get them doing habitually that's going to naturally build some, some of these perceptions of control, some confidence and competence, some things that we think of as maybe self-esteem or whatever, but these are components of it. And, and they're also, 
They also, if you notice, these modulate cortisol. Cortisol gets modulated by your daily routines, gets regulated by your sleep-wake cycles. You get people in routines and rituals. It's going to help them. A lot of times if you take them out of those routines and rituals, that's when health problems develop, right? So in a sort of nutshell, it becomes this balancing act between protection and adversity. And it doesn't mean that one is going to prevail over the other. What, what has come to light is that the more risk factors you have, guess what about protective factors? The more you're going to need to balance it out to, to, have, to avoid some of the, the, the bad outcomes. And there have by now been some studies that, uh, that look at building protective factors. We've done some, we did some years ago in a, in a population that I worked with that was extremely high risk, and we showed that, guess what? If you build protective factors over time, it also predicts better functioning over time. You know, again, it's sort of a duh finding, but we wanted to see whether we take extremely high risk people and actually build protective factors, and it seemed like we could and we did, and it worked. And so this works, but you have to start on an individual level, kid by kid. It's kind of what keeps me having fun with my job is that every kid that comes in my office is a different puzzle. They may have some protective factors, but they don't have these others. So if I get busy building these others, then I give them more, and then they got more, and the more they have, the better they are until they're 18 and they're off to the adult world. And Good luck. You know, so you try to build as much as you can until they're 18 they're out the door. You know, and, and you hope you've built enough to maybe tilt the course a little bit better than one. So I'm going to stop now, and, and these are um, kind of uh, different pathways for different people. So I'm going to take some questions now, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah, are they? Okay, all right. So I guess this is what we do. Which of the following statements about developmental risk factors is false? Should I read them out? A, no single risk factor inevitably leads to poor life outcomes. True or false? B, increasing numbers of risk factors have an additive effect on leading to poor outcomes. C, increasing numbers of risk factors have an exponential effect on leading to poor outcomes. No, D, no particular risk factor is specific to a particular poor life outcome. D, additive. That's true. It's not additive, it's exponential. Next question. All of the following have been shown to be protective factors in studies of resilient youths except Involvement in structured adult supervised group activities. B, having an adult friend outside of one's parents to talk to and get support from, also known as a mentor. C, having good compliance with recommended medical treatment. D, growing up in a home with rules, rituals, and positive discipline. C, as much as we like to, like ourselves, you know, I often see you know, on these lists of strengths and a treatment plan, strength of this kid is he's engaged in therapy and takes medication regularly. That's not a protective factor. I mean, it's good medical compliance, but that's not on the list of protective factors. So be humble. <laughs> Some of the known neurophysiological mechanisms of psychosocial protective factors include modulation of cortisol and the hypothalamic pituitary axis, true or false. Release of oxytocin in the context of safe and supportive relationships. Increase in testosterone during self-esteem boosting activities. D, all of the above. All of the above. That's it. All right. All right. Now, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Dr. Vance, thank you. That was fascinating and wonderful. And the first thing I'd like to ask is if you could share those slides with us. I saw many of us taking pictures of them as we went through because they had some really important information on them. I assume Janie can do that for me, right? Yeah. That would be great because I think we could use it all in our lives. Absolutely. Uh, with children and with uh, ourselves and everybody else. Right. The one thing that I didn't see up there that I've seen in some of the literature is self-talk. 
So the ability to give yourself messages, to calm your brain, to do different things, and how that affects neural tracts. Could you speak to that for a little bit? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a great point. And, and, and you know what, the thing that I've been fascinated with is uh, how many protective factors come down to perception. So self-talk you could think of as maybe one mechanism by which we kind of enact perception. You know, we perceive that we have control over a situation. We perceive that we're good at something. You know, when, when they've looked at, at resilient people, um, one of the protective factors is the perception of competence. You don't actually have to be good. You just have to think you're good, <laughs> right? So perception is, is – and perception really becomes reality, right? And we've known this in psychiatry and psychology forever, you know, Psycho-cybernetics, po power of positive thinking, and, and a lot of that really. So I would think of, of self-talk as a tool that can be used, for example, by therapists, which we've done for years. You know, I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy is a lot of self-talk, right? And, and so what we have now maybe is some way of explaining how is it that self-talk can actually help you? Well, probably it's enhancing your perception of something, of control, of competence, of being loved. So again, like, it, it's not so much whether I, I, I see all this love between the parent, the mother and child that comes into my office. If I get that kid alone, and, and, and even after the, the mom's been grouchy to him and fussing at him and hollering at him, and, and we think, God, this is emotionally abusive kind of thing, I want to talk to this kid alone, kick the mom out, and I said, wow, it seems like you and your mom have a lot of conflict. Do you think she really loves you? Oh, yeah, my mom loves me. That's the protective factor, not whether or not we judge. Now, it's a separate uh, factor if there's a positive relationship. So, so there's two protective factors in, a, in, in judging a, 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 a parent-child relationship. One is whether it's positive, warm, supportive, and loving with all the oxytocin things. The other is the perception that you're loved or not. So, th so that, I think that explains itself. Uh, two questions. One is the, the differences in the left-right brain. And so yeah. is that true for left-handed people as well? That's an excellent question. And, and you know, that left-right brain thing is, is kind of this chronic dilemma because some of it, some of it doesn't. But, I don't know the answer to that. I, I just know that here, here's another interesting thing about, about it. When they looked at um, these Buddhist monks who go into a cave for 10 years and meditate on world peace, compassion, and love, when they come out and they do that same EEG sticker thing, they are so far left, they're off the charts. With the, and, and you can't startle those guys. Too. You can't like they, they don't startle, you know, and 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 so there, there's these plastic things that happen somehow by maybe mindfulness meditation. The left right, I don't know the answer to that, but that's an excellent question. The other question is, is in terms of the high risk populations, does it work? I would think all of these things you talked about would work in our prison populations, um, and it would be applicable. And I'm sure you could see efficacy. I wonder about permanence, though, that, you know, because unfortunately some of the features may not be permanent. Yeah. Is there data to suggest that this may make a difference in terms of recidivism or reduction and et cetera? Well, you know, that's, that's a complicated question. Um, recidivism um, in a certain portion, of, if you're talking about our prison population, recidivism um, is uh, a, a complicated thing. One thing that we do know is that a lot of uh, antisocial people decrease in their <laughs> social um, behaviors through the ages, through, through, or through the 40s. Like once they reach a certain age, their antisocial behaviors just sort of fizzle out. Now a certain subset of those, the sort of psychopathic uh, criminal types, don't, don't change. And so in terms of your permanence versus, plas it's a plasticity question a little bit. And, and one thing that, that we know is that Adults are plastic, too. We're finding that out. Even really old adults, even you go into geriatric settings, you can impose some, like, bottom-up kinds of 
behaviors on geriatric and sh see brain changes, which is a, a aha moment because when I was in medical school, you know, once you reached your 20s, flatline and, you know, <laughs> but now we know there's plasticity. We don't know how much plasticity, I, I don't think yet. And we do know that if you stop doing that bottom-up stuff with the geriatrics, it, they'll regress back to where they were. So you kind of have to keep doing that, probably that protective factor. And there's no, you know, that's kind of like there's no silver bullet. You know, you can't hope that a protective factor, you go in, you do it, and you get out, and you're done forever. You kind of got to keep going, keep going. Prison population is really no different than picking a group of really high-risk people. There's, there's going to be some relatively re resilient people in there. The more protective factors you could build, probably the better off they're going to be in the long run, so on and so forth. So good question. Yeah. Thank Hi. you so much. Um, there are definitely things that we can do as far as the bottom up. The top down seem a little more hard hardwired to some extent. Um, and to be honest, this has only been studied for you know X amount of years, but there have always been resilient people. Um, has anybody looked at any genetic potential contributing factors that may make people well, so, more tr trend in that direction? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I think they're starting to you're starting to see some things like I mean, th there's some fascinating genetic studies, for example, on degree of methylation of certain genes that are risk genes versus possible, probably protective genes. There are inborn characteristics of personality or temperament that are protective factors. Um, IQ is, is actually a protective factor, and we know that, that there's definitely genetic and inborn qualities. So there are congenital protective factors, um, and, and, and those are, those are uh, I think, only beginning to be looked at because we've typically been so focused on inborn risk factors. You know, we're, we're basically focused on risk because that's what we see in our offices. And we don't see resilient people because they don't come to our offices. So we meet them and they might be sitting in the room and, and you know, but so, so there, and for example, there, there are people who are, seem to be inherently resilient. They've looked at soldiers um, who don't get PTSD in spite of going to combat, combat, combat. The military is good at looking at this stuff because the stakes are high, right? So they look at what's the difference on those guys? They found that they have high um, blood levels of NPY, which is neuro, uh, uh, oh, yeah, neuropeptide Y. Neuropeptide Y is a, seems to be protective against PTSD. So there's a chemical, and I don't know, was it congenital for that guy, or did he develop it along the way? I don't know. All I know is that I work with the most plastic group of, of human beings there are, and that's kids. So I'm going to do all I can, you know, for the kids, because they're plastic. I got time, you know, and, and they'll do the most changing, but how much is enough? I don't know. How much is congenital? Can we develop some fast tracks to... to Take a, 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 a and take a congenitally challenged kid and and turn that to you know can we demethylate with love for you know and we know you know that sounds funny right but but there's been studies on Romanian orphans who get either adopted into a therapeutic foster home where they get taught how to love you know they they get loved you know because they clinically supervise the parents on how to show love. And those kids, their cortisol regularizes versus the kids who go to just sort of garden variety group homes or stay in the orphanage. And so, you know, I don't know how much is possible. I don't think we know how much is possible. We know that kids are plastic and we know we can change stuff. We do know that there are some inherently resilient people, naturally resilient. And that's really what the studies were based on. They weren't kids that we did intervention with. All, all, all we've done is take what we've learned from naturally resilient people and try to impose it on clinical populations and seeing that to the extent that we do, they, they function better. Yeah.
Okay, so hi, I'm Tanya from Page Trauma. Hey, Dr. Vance, hi. how are you? Hi, um, just wanted to share quick for those of you that like visual things and YouTube. YouTube has this little video. It's called Brain's Journey to Resilience. It is the cutest little thing. It's about seven and a half minutes long, and it kind of shows you what the, to the effects of toxic stress. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of the Roanoke Prevention Alliance and their Resiliency Collective. Um, I know that I'm a member of the professional education piece, and I know Dr. Vance does the Trauma Informed Care Network, which is kind of like a network of counselors who do trauma, and they're trauma informed and they're actually trauma counselors so they can help kids build the resilience that they need in order to kind of work through it. Thank you, Tanya. You're welcome. That shameless plug will cost you, Tanya. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think we're out of time, so thank you very much, sir. Thank you. For everyone who's on the line, we hey, apologize. We did not have time to unmute that. the so phone, but you can always email us at outreach at corellianclinic.org, and I can get them to the center. With that, we're going to go ahead and get phone lines now. Thank you all very much for joining us.